Let's rock and roll, Zach. Let's do it. Welcome back once again to the Fieldwork Podcast. This season of the podcast is made possible by a grant from the Walton Family Foundation. I am Zach Johnson. And I'm Mitchell Hora. You know, last year on the podcast, we talked a lot about carbon markets and, and we covered everything. We talked a lot about this from from the scrutiny that they're under to what could they become. And it was kind of like, and it still kind of is like, what exactly is going to happen here with these things? Yeah. Sorry for pushing on a lot of that, Zach, and having us continue to, to talk about it. But it is a really important topic and a lot of people have interest in it. So uh, we got to talk about it and we're going to talk about it some more here today. Yeah, we, we have talked with uh, an egg lender. We have talked with the Iowa Secretary of Agriculture about this. Um, we talked a lot about it at your field day, actually, there in Washington, Iowa. I mean, it's just, it's such a big, big topic. Yep. So we're going to talk about it again today. And uh, we've got the CEO of a company that specializes in selling um, carbon offsets. And uh, so we're going to dive into this on what's happening and, you know, kind of what is the promise for farmers, especially as we're being looked to 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 help with climate issues. Yeah, to me personally, um, this is a big deal. It, it continues to be more and more interesting, I think, as we're kind of evolving and starting to see where this might go. So our guest today is Manuel Pinuela. Did I say that, Man Manuel? Did I say that correctly? Perfect. Sir. Excellent. Great, okay. Sir. He is the chief executive officer at Cultivo in California. In 2017, he was named to MIT Technology Review's list of innovators under 35. And in 2019, he, he co-founded Cultivo. So, Manuel, thanks for hopping on the show. Uh, excited to dig further into this. But first, explain, you know, what the heck is Cultivo? What do you guys actually do? Thank you so much for the uh, for the invitation to be here, guys. So Cultivo is a climate-focused fintech, and everything that we do is to accelerate capital into in, to natural capital. So in essence, what that means is to deploy capital faster to land regeneration. For example, our purpose is to regenerate 1% of the world. So even though... Um, Carbon has been connected significantly to regeneration. The key driver for Cultivo is that we unlock capital to go and regenerate from farms to ranches to different types of ecosystem. But really from a nature-based solution perspective, we're looking at biodiversity, water, and then carbon. I think this is, uh, you, you touched it in one of your, your episodes, but it's fundamental that sometimes people forget that carbon from nature doesn't happen just like that. You do need biodiversity. First, you need water. And then because of that, then you have a result of uh, captured carbon. So that's what we do. We basically partner with landowners, farmers, ranchers, and uh, we set up investment vehicles as part of portfolios that meet an investor's criteria. And that investor could be a financial institution. Uh, primarily, that's our beachhead market, as well as corporations. So you just mentioned that you guys kind of have a, a goal of regenerating 1% of the world. Uh, how big is that? What is 1% of the world? Help, help us wrap our minds around that. It is an insane goal, guys. It's uh, the basically regenerating two states of Texas combined or the size of Mongolia. Two of the states of Texas. I hear Texas is pretty big. Everything in Texas is big. It is. That's a big deal. That is. Um, okay, so are, are, how does it actually work? So you're going to, to projects that need some investment going into them and you guys are helping to line up the financing? It all starts with we have a series of proprietary algorithms that look for areas around the world uh, from a global scale. We are uh, agnostic on the countries. Uh, we were actually agnostic on the land activity as far as it's conducive to natural capital, that biodiversity, water, and carbon gain. And of course, doing that with environmental and social safeguards. So basically, the algorithm looks for those hotspots of degradation, distressed natural assets, and then we package them in portfolios that would meet an investor's criteria. Now, to your second question uh, there, Mitchell, the, the piece that is very interesting is that many investors are looking at this as a new asset class where they say to us, hey, Cultivo, I want to deploy 50 million or 100 million. You tell me where. So we have pre-packaged portfolios. That's where you know we have decided what's the best mix. Or uh, a more... Uh, 
advanced uh, financial institution, advanced in the sense of already having a specific sweet tooth for something that they like to invest. So for example, it could be North America, they want to include land acquisition, and they want to include a specific ecosystem, call it agroforestry. So then we create a custom uh, origination-led portfolios, as we call them. And so as we as we go through those customers, they will normally fit on those two pockets. There are customers that also fit the pure carbon-led portfolio lens, which that means they really just want to go into the trading of the carbon from hedging purposes for their net zero goals uh, or as a, as a source of profit. And the final one is think about the already very large and established corporations with a lot of land holdings that have been sitting on them for many years. They know they're degraded, almost like a landowner, uh, a traditional landowner, and they want us to, uh, to look at their whole acreage as a portfolio, but again, from a natural capital perspective. So in summary, origination-led portfolios, carbon-led portfolios, and uh, services. Before we get too deep into the weeds here. I want to. I want to know. You know, who, who are you, Manuel, and why did you start this company? Where did you come from, and what drove you to do this? Well, I'm an electronic engineer by training, and I've been about 16 years on venture building. Cultivo is my fourth venture. the The mix uh, there, Zach, is that I've been all my life creating ventures that drive and find data or understand existing data through sensors. I started with sensors. I have a PhD in optical and semiconductor devices, as well as a fellowship in the business school, because I wanted to figure out how to uh, use technology to solve problems. In uh, all of my experience, I've gone from either really figuring out what data is missing to solve a problem. So for example, the, the first problem that I started to solve was solar lighting in rural Mexico 16 years ago. How can you deploy that when the grid is unreliable or non-existent? To then wireless power transfer to power sensors, and that went into the ag space, industrial space, and fintech. Then how to figure out how to use data to achieve positive clinical outcomes, for example, with women with gestational diabetes. And then big leap after now having a bit of bandwidth and resources to tackle something that was very close to heart. It started actually in the UK where I lived uh, 12 years that I was going from a pristine uh, forest in the Lake District and then passing through almost a mud-bound set of farms. And I just couldn't believe uh, the contrast. Also, for being a a Mexican, I saw land degradation in one of the family's lands throughout all my childhood. So it was really close to heart, but I couldn't figure out how could a landowner first see if their land can bounce back, how much effort and resources is that going to take, and let alone could there be returns in that bounce back. And so that's when uh, about three and a half years ago with a co-founder and a bunch of guys that uh, and, and women that helped join this mission started to create algorithms that would allow us to know, okay, this plot of land can actually bounce back. So from its geobiological attributes and what is the value that it could be sitting on. Of course, you mentioned at the beginning, carbon is one of those values, but see it more as a a distribution of revenue streams that could come from unlocking all that yield. In ag, carbon credits and carbon offset markets, stuff like that is a huge topic. But what we're talking about here is the broader scope of carbon offset markets or other ecosystem services, which I love that you're not just focused on carbon, but it's biodiversity, habitat, water, you know, it, because it is so important to be more holistic and not just pigeonhole ourselves into the carbon component of it only. But explain, especially to the, the listeners, that a lot of farmers now are hearing about carbon offset markets and, and it's basically being correlated to on your row crop operation do reduce tillage, add cover crop, reduce synthetic, synthetic nitrogen. That's basically what it boils down to. And you get paid, basically privatized cost share to make some changes. But carbon offset markets or other ecosystem service markets, they're not new. They've been around for a long time. And most of the offsets are into other projects and things that you guys are involved in, the wetlands and the forestry and, and rangelands, stuff like that. 
explain kind of the overall concepts and stuff here from a, a fairly high level that uh, you know carbon offsets and stuff have been around for a long time, but it's in lots of different sectors. Um, the concept of a carbon ton that someone is capturing or avoiding its its release and to pay for that has existed for a while. And it has existed for a while across multiple ecosystems and across multiple land activities. So you can see it as a matrix of uh, the different types of carbon crediting processes that exist around the world. And what we're getting into because of the demand of them is that people are putting different scores to them in terms of how valuable they are. And valuable could be, hopefully, uh, continue to be connected to how additional is. Is it a real carbon ton? Can someone, can an auditor come to it and actually see that the carbon is being captured or avoided? Can it be durable? So will it will that carbon ton be there for a very long time? And would, for example, uh, a term called leakage, has that project had a positive impact on, let's say, all the neighboring sites? Or because that project started, then someone else, for example, if you start a reforestation project, does that mean that someone else, your neighbor, started cutting down trees? So as we go into the different elements of that matrix in terms of uh, the ecosystem and the land, uh, that the land uses that are conducive to ecosystem services, such as carbon, what starts to happen is that then uh, historically a lot of registries came up uh, from the Veras, Gold Standard, Climate Action Reserve, American Carbon Registry, and you name it. And now more and more and more of those uh, registries are coming up. And not only nonprofits, it, they tend to be historically only nonprofits organizations, and now they're for profits that are realizing that those original registries have a lot of different bottlenecks and they believe they, they can do a better job at, at being the registry that says, here's a protocol that is better, that it's better could be because it's faster, because it captures a pocket of that metrics that uh, no one was capturing carbon for and therefore it helps bring more landowners. There are different motivations, but at the end of the day, for our partners, the landowners and us, we have a series of another tool that basically says, based on that ecosystem, that region, and that land activity, this is how many ecosystem services, basically natural capital, you're going to be able to unlock. And there are there is a recipe that we need to follow. Um, and that recipe is normally called the methodology or the protocol. Once you follow that, then you, um, you submit it to the registry for a peer review. And... As you continue to go through your land, like to the middle of, call it Bolivia or Montana or Wyoming, even from Germany, to just verify that what the landowner was doing was, was true. And so uh, as we move to sensors and to different technologies that allow us to know in more detail what is happening on the ground, then those auditors could just be receiving data. When we go then, let me break down the final part of the question. When we break down in terms of the natural capital, then you're bound to what registries and therefore methodologies and marketplaces exist wherever you are. So for example, in Mexico, or actually in some parts of the US, carbon is really the main driver of those new revenue streams from ecosystem services. And so what we do is that we bundle the value of biodiversity and water into the, into the credit itself. And historically, but I don't have a lot of history here because Cultivo is a two-year-old company, uh, that increases the price of, how, of um, that ton and what it trades for because of those additional attributes. That was a long answer, but uh, I wanted to give the, uh, the full overview, at least from Cultivo's perspective. That's how this world is working. I think that answers a little bit of, of the questions that we at least as farmers, I certainly have is, you know, what, who decides what equals a credit and then how much is that worth? You know, how, I, I think those are, those are some of the biggest questions that I have is how do we know what a certain practice is actually worth? Yeah. And, and I think that the, the first part of that is that practice of, for example, in, in, um, 
as Mitchell was saying, one of our projects, it's about the, the change that you do in terms of how you're, how you're operating or running your operation. Uh, call it uh, a row crop or an agroforestry project or a, or a cattle business. And so the value of that is going to be for how long do you want to do it? So durability, how different it is to your existing practices. Uh, basically, is there an additionality component to it? And the, so that already says you're going to receive a carbon credit as far as you follow a protocol. So that stack is quite, I would say, quite binary, right? As far as you do what the paper says you have to do, you get it. But then in, when we go into the nuance of the value, and so this is when, from a Cultivo point of view, it's about the underlying data that proves that what you're doing is real. And so that comes to, have you increased the biodiversity mean space, uh, mean species index by X? Have you increased your soil moisture potential by Y? And all of those attributes get bundled on the credit. Now, at the moment, Cultivo has been, it's awashed by uh, off-takers, financial institutions or corporations that want to buy that those carbon credits. And therefore, we have the ability to set a price but we're very transparent about the prices that we've been able to achieve. So for example, Cultivo about a year and a half ago transacted at $15 per ton. The latest was at just a month ago, $18 per ton. And every single conversation that we're having is now starting at $24 per ton. Now, we're a small part of that market. So what the whole market needs to answer your second question is that everyone is as transparent as Cultivo is, so that indices start to be created against that matrix of uh, land activities and ecosystems. So that is transparent and not over the counter. In that system there, okay, so that 15 to now going to $24 per ton, you know, a lot of the ag like offset market stuff, they're looking at a farmer being paid same type of deal, that 15 to maybe $20 a ton or so. Um, is it the same value for any different offset market, like a forestry credit versus a ag credit or grazing or a grasslands credit? Are they all worth the same? It's short answer. Not all carbon credits are equal. And there is a significant distinction that has been going on already for a while between reductions um, and avoidance. So ca are you really capturing carbon or are you and let's say new carbon captured, or are you avoiding carbon to be emitted? So for example, avoiding carbon to be emitted is when you are stopping a forest to, from being logged or flattened. And um, that's normally through a, through, um, an, a protocol called RED, R-E-D-D plus, and they tend to be historically lower in terms of um, the price at which they were transacting, but because there's so little supply of high quality, high integrity uh, projects, good red plus projects are even now starting to trade at uh, $15 or $16 per ton. But at the end of the day, in general, projects that are capturing new carbon tend to achieve higher prices because the ability to prove that uh, additionality and durability tends to be easier. And I know you've seen some of our stuff and probably seen me complaining about the definition of additionality for yeah. ag and how I think it's pretty messed up because explain additionality in like a forestry project like that where it's not being logged and now I'm being paid to not log it. But a lot of those projects, I would assume, would not ever be logged anyway. And maybe they are, maybe I'm being naive to it, but in that instance, I don't see any practice change there. So how come they can get additionality for, you know, it's not being logged now, it's not going to be logged in the future versus, you know, I, I don't see where the practice change is, I guess. No, and you're right. Uh, actually, one, one reason of why I was prompting that distinction is that uh, in essence for uh, farming practices, you could argue that the same could be achieved, right? If you have been a farmer that has been, going through your practices on a very sustainable way, you could argue that then there should be an incentive for ensuring that you stay on, on that path and actually just continue to improve. Well, because of the um, avoidance too. I mean, I know that I've exactly. got 120 or so tons of carbon in each acre of my soil. We've quantified it. 
So 120 tons right there that I'm avoiding the, you know, potential loss of like, so yeah, no, I, I love how you, how you went there. Sorry. Keep- no, no, per- perfect, Mitchell, because that's the way, and this is already starting to happen, right? So with, uh, we are in, com- in conversations with many of those registries and they're starting to, to see that there's that distinction as well. But then the, the case here is, and this is a very difficult piece. So let's assume for a second, Mitchell, that we're for farmers, we're going to be able to show that if you've been doing good, sustainable practices that are keeping that carbon there, you should be awarded carbon credits and biodiversity credits and water credits. So this is also one piece that I I want to highlight is to many other parts of the natural capital stack. It's uh, especially biodiversity what you're doing would be really, really valuable. So there's there's a whole conversation of are there mitigation credits or like in the UK, biodiversity credits, Australia is coming with new, Colombia and many others. But going back to carbon, if we would then be able to prove that you have pressures, so for example, and, and, and I know you do as a farmer because any farmer has them, would it, would it be better, maybe just in the short term, to all of a sudden change your practices because you would increase productivity. What you really want to help that farmer to do is for you to not even think about doing that because you would completely uh, release all of that carbon. So what the market should be therefore incentivizing is you as a farmer with good practices to keep that carbon store there. So will Cultivo, your company itself, have these checks and balances in place and the actual auditor's working under the the cultivo umbrella that will go out and say is this forest actually under that pressure and did this farmer actually make those changes will you guys have that in place at your company or is that a, a, a different branch or different piece of the system so we we do have that we're not we don't check our own homework but we have all the underlying data so that the auditors that go to our projects can see it so it's all all in one roof so what we've realize Zach, that is that we had to, and there's a value from a business perspective to have this all under one roof from the bringing the investors to being able to partner with landowners and farmers uh, to also have all the data that makes up the quality of that project that we've partnered with. Because it's a, you know, it's a super long marriage, right? That back to then durability or permanence, we want these projects to be there for 20, if not a hundred years. So where do you see this going for like ag that, you know, ag is fairly early into this still. Um, There's a lot of interest, but there's, you know, a long, long, long way to go. How are you guys approaching ag and at least in in kind of the way that we, you know, think about it on the show in regards to mostly like row crop ag? Yeah. So for row crops, what the key here is that I, I would say still that the jury is out. But not out as in, oh, there, there's nothing to be done. They're still debating the science of it. It's, the science is getting quite solid. And more importantly, the methods of measurement are, are getting really advanced to the fact that it's not only about taking those um, core soil samples and sending them to a lab to, to see how much carbon, but actually ones that are, can be way easier to deploy. And so what we're seeing is that many of those new methodologies are coming up specific for row cropping. And as those methodologies come in, and therefore then the technology that we deploy to measure uh, all the underlying natural capital are also coming up. So from the ability to do a soil sample right on the spot was not even in existence a year ago, Mitchell. So our position will always be that we will continue to select what are the best methodologies, then bring the capital, because a lot of capital wants to flow to row cropping from a carbon biodiversity and a water perspective. So our customers are saying, can we please deploy to portfolios that look like this? And the answer on our side is being yes. And we're starting to uh, speak to many, many landowners to enroll them as part of our portfolios where we've seen pockets of degradation through our algorithms. And uh, we're just making sure that we're aligning those to to the right methodologies and protocols. What I haven't seen, though, is more clear definitions between that avoided versus removal distinction, which is so 
clear in the forest world and in many other ecosystems, but not in row crops. Well, the biggest thing there is that right now they're basing it all essentially on just a couple of practices versus what is your actual drawdown and your actual sequestration versus your actual removals and such. And so, yeah, there's a long way to go to really be able to understand. And I think the biggest thing in ag is your carbon footprint is going to be different every year. And that's what's been completely avoid, you know, um, not brought in at all. And that's what I've been really pushing back on is that my carbon footprint's going to be different every year. And especially in terms of being able to reward farmers based on merit and based on how aggressive they can get that some years I can grow a cover crop that's five foot tall and it's going to be pumping in a ton of carbon. I've got 12,000 pounds of biomass out there with all that cover crop and I'm getting a bunch of carbon down in the ground. In other years, that cover crop, getting it on is going to be tough and, uh, and let alone seeing how big it can really get and such too. So where I think we've got to be able to go is being able to showcase how much carbon are you actually getting? What's your actual footprint on a given year? And, and my thought for ag and what I wanted to get your feedback on is that I believe that in ag, we're going to have to be able to open up a lot more transparency around how do you calculate your actual annual carbon footprint, where then you get paid based on lowering your actual annual carbon footprint and then potentially and utilize mitigation credits and stuff to be able to draw down if you're losing carbon today. You get paid based on drawing down and lowering your carbon footprint. If you're actually sequestering carbon today and you're net negative at the beginning here, or you're carbon neutral at least, that then you get paid, you know, actual sequestration credits. If you are actually on an annual basis drawing down and, and offsetting your own carbon footprint plus that of others, do you think we can get to that point where it's based on your actual annual carbon footprint, or am I just completely way out, way out of whack? No, 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 you're not. Well, my personal opinion is you're not. And there, to me, the answer to that is going to be those technologies that allow us to really measure what's going on. So rather than saying to you as a farmer, hey, here's this protocol that you have to, has a, that is already going to say how many tons of carbon you're going to capture on a yearly basis because a baseline was created, which is the fundamental issue of, of what you're alluding to there, Mitchell, right? And so the best answer so far was, Okay, if you're already going, doing good practices, let's not take your baseline right now because therefore your yield is really small. Let's take the baseline, let us allow for the last five years, right? I, I say we throw that all out of whack and your baseline right. is based on what is your actual footprint, not based on practices, not based on you know what you were doing and then the practice changed to trigger additionality the way that we copied and pasted it from other offsets. And I know mm -hmm. that because as you might know, I'm on the working group with the Climate Action Reserve. Well, I was there. And, when and the that's why, right. no, perfect. Exactly, Mitchell, because I think then the answer is that you don't put it based on where the year of the baseline was, but actually in the fact that on whatever you're measuring, right? So, and so there's a lot of conversation that is moving to a, a year ton uh, as it's being framed by by some methodologies. But the, the core principle to me is that given the fact that we can now measure many of those attributes, let alone on a yearly basis, but actually on a daily basis, sometimes at a minute basis, what that allows us to do is to say, okay, as far as you have, and I think I, I'm starting already, I cannot disclose who, which registries, uh, but we're starting to see that there's a significant shift to digital monitoring, reporting, and verification. As a very simple component, just imagine that you have a stake on the ground that is measuring on an hourly basis how much carbon and your contents on the soil are. And therefore, as far as your everyone, all the parties are in agreement that we're going to be minting credits, carbon based on what the instruments are measuring, then what that does is that it does not allow you to forecast what's going to be in the future because it's then very instantaneous to a specific time span around that measurement. And so then you do your tally after a year. That's, I think, what you're alluding to, and that's what you get. We are going to take a quick break right now, and we'll be back after just a bit. So are we getting so in-depth there and so granular that could that be, you know, not even attainable to try to accomplish with a half million or a million farms just here in the U.S. alone? I think it is possible, Zach, that we will be able to do what Mitchell is saying, because actually many of our 
uh, operations, in fact, in all of the operations that I uh, mentioned um, a couple of minutes ago, we are basically taking the carbon footprint of that operation to know exactly what is the net contribution that that operation is having. And actually, the reason, of, the main driving reason that we're seeing that farmers want to do it is because they want to now start to say that their product is a, is a net zero product. And the reason why that is even more valuable than the carbon credit itself is the fact that, for example, if you have a net zero operation, that allows you to sell your produce at a way higher price to the supply chain, basically your off-taker of that produce, because that off-taker and more off-takers are moving to a net zero label on their final product. So all of a sudden, uh, we are now, what I love about this conversation where Mitchell was already taking us to, is that we're now moving the conversation not to carbon credits. We're moving the conversation of a net zero economy in the sense that net zero products being demanded by consumers are achieving a higher price than, than traditional practices, the produce coming from traditional practices. So I think that the first and foremost, to your, your question, Zach, can we do it? Yes, because the digitization of how to capture all of those data, those data points, basically in the emissions world, scope one, scope two, scope three, direct or indirect emissions, is now being uh, very easy to, to capture. The sensors there are becoming a commodity, so it's even faster and easier to capture all that data. The processing is actually not that complex. But I go back to what the market mechanisms are. And I think if landowners see that their products will achieve a higher price in the market because they're net zero, because you've done the tally that Mitchell mentioned, that's really what's going to be the driver. Because now you have the multiple revenue streams that we want uh, the, the farms where we invest to have, which is now you have your produce achieving a higher price because of your practices, taking it organic plus, regenerative organic, and all the different labels that are coming, net zero labeling of foods. Then you have, of course, then the uh, carbon component, the biodiversity component, and the water. So then... I'm going two steps further is what you really want to avoid doing is the double counting. So this is now I'm going to <laughs> another terminology between offsetting and insetting. So, but it's exactly what Mitchell mentioned. If you have injected to your produce that carbon, then your produce is net zero. If you then have surplus, then you can go and sell it as a new revenue stream in the market. So what we're seeing, Zach, is this can be done and we're doing it. It's not difficult. It does require capital. That's why we also wanted to make sure that to, to our partner landowners, we're not starting to say, hey, come and do this. And by the way, we're expecting you to open the wallet. We're saying, actually, no. The financial markets want to invest in this, but it's your prerogative as a landowner if you want to invest or not directly. And then let's go and do the, the changes. And so a lot of, to, to give you a bit more color on that conversation, what has been happening with our cattle ranchers or uh, our agroforestry operations is that they are, even on the forestry side for timber, they're starting to say, well, hold on a second, where do, where do we deploy that, those new carbon um, credits? Do we sell them on the market or do we embed them in the pros itself because it achieves different uh, returns? It's a really, really good point. And, and uh, definitely how I've been kind of thinking about it, that you can either have your carbon story tied to your commodity product and put it into the supply chain. Basically, just like we already have uh, data on our bushel of grain, like the test weight and the moisture and the FM, you know, and they do testing of the grain and then they blend it at the elevator or we blend it all the time on the farm a lot of farmers do of your blending corn and stuff so that that bushel then in an aggregate actually ends up being better quality same type of thing here but it's tying together that commodity physical product with a digital uh asset as well that's linked to that bushel and that digital asset could be it's you know it's a biodiversity impact it's water impact return to water use ratios and stuff like that return to carbon use but but man, well, you're thinking that if if I've got corn that's carbon negative, you know, that each each ton is, you know, 
carbon negative, not just carbon neutral. And I don't know, maybe I'm not saying that right. But if I'm carbon negative, I could offset somebody else's corn that's carbon positive and be able to have a net now aggregate carbon neutral product. Is that kind of how we think about it? Yeah, I think maybe let me take an example of something that any of us could go into the supermarket and, and buy, for example, uh, a pint of milk that is carbon neutral, and it will have a carbon neutral label. So what producers of that milk have done is that they've taken, uh, they've reduced their emissions to get to that pint of milk, and whatever they couldn't uh, reduce their emissions for, basically their true emissions, then they're offsetting those. So that is carbon neutral. Where did those carbon offsets come from to, to make that pint of milk carbon neutral? Hopefully, it came, it came from their own operations. I think that the key there is very well-managed operations would have that balance that you're saying. It's, you, you can make your own products carbon neutral, plus you will have surplus, and then you're achieving the 2x or sometimes even the 6x versus uh, standard produce when you're carbon neutral. Uh, prices on that are all over the place, to be honest. And it depends a lot on the produce from meat to dairy to uh, almonds now. It's happening across the, the whole uh, chain. But if you're starting to see that additional kicker in your farm uh, revenues, and then you see that you have, call it maybe a 1,000 or 100,000 tons from surplus, then that gives you that additional revenue piece that will completely prove the point, and I'm going back to the other structure that we're going through, on the additionality. That as a farmer, you will not go back to your other practices if you're able to achieve that. Do you have, Manuel, specific personal examples yet of, of farmers like Mitchell and I, row crop production farms, actually finding success with this and receiving payments and being able to sell credits yet? Not in our portfolio. Uh, we've started with um, sustainable grazing management practices and agroforestry, but we are um, in advanced conversations with a series of farmers that have been running their operations and now want to expand with us uh, from row cropping and primarily uh, barley, alfalfa, um, corn, and soy. And they have been uh, quite successful because they have been able to embed themselves into the supply chain of a brand that is saying we are carbon neutral. And so they started actually their relationship as providing the produce. Then they then they started to provide the carbon and they're now fully embedded into that supply chain. So as we kind of work towards wrapping up and stuff here, what do you see as some of the major things that like row crop farmers like us should be looking for? What do you think is coming down the pipeline? Like, and what are you telling farmers today about what how they should be thinking about this whole arena? The the biggest thing is start getting data from your farm so that you never get bitten by the when did this start it, right? So start getting data as to how much how much uh, carbon are you getting, what are your net emissions are. So uh, really there are many, many tools out there free that allow you to, to calculate your carbon footprint, as well as how much you are capturing uh, or avoiding emissions for. What I would put really, uh, this is no marketing ploy, uh, reach out to Cultivo because we would be able to figure out without biases, because it's an algorithm that's really making a decision tree, what are the best registries and, and methodologies for your land activity. Uh, I think that question continues to be the main driver as to why landowners come to us is, okay, yes, I want to do this, but against what? And what is the value? Right? I know that my land is degraded, so let's start, but how? So if you already know what you want to do, just measure, 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 measure would be my the, the key message that I would give to those farmers. In your opinion now, we've got a lot of big companies specifically, or at least here in the United States, we've got big companies making a lot of big claims as far as, you know, we're going to be, um, we're going to be carbon neutral by 2030, that sort of thing. Do you think the majority of those companies making those claims are going to be able to achieve that? And is it possible that we'd hit a certain point to where 
we just don't have the proven carbon credits to be able to sell to make those claims for those companies? What's going to happen with all that? Let's put it this way. If they will have to, because they've done the pledge to their shareholders, and if they don't achieve it, their stock is going to collapse. So there's a significant market pressure right on, on their necks to achieve it. So they've done the pledge. That's it. But uh, are there enough carbon credits out there to do this? The answer is no. So that's the sole reason of why we ha- are very focused upstream on creating work that the supply to achieve those net zero pledges. Zach. So the answer is, are all of them going to be able to achieve it just by carbon credits? No. And therefore, what they should be investing and many of, of the companies that are on that, that trajectory is they are reducing their emissions first. They are avoiding emissions. And carbon should be the final, uh, the final mile, right, to, to get to that net zero pledge. Is it possible to reach net zero as a planet Earth at some point? Maybe not within our lifetime, but do you think that that could happen? Yes. Yeah, I, I do think so. There's a lot of technology that has to be developed that doesn't exist. Though. Yeah, no, I definitely well and definitely see where the opportunity can be. But to your point, you know, at least in today's available offsets, they definitely don't exist for the demand and for all these companies that were that are wanting them. But what do you foresee as, you know, how should farmers be navigating this then that today the credits are worth 15. Now you're talking $24 and they're still not enough. So the, the demand is way higher than the supply. You know, should we be continuing to wait and allow for the, the value of these credits to go up? in order to continue to play the supply and demand game and uh, and trying to demand a better price for the actual carbon because we can actually do it. We can actually be part of the solution. Yeah, but but I don't think that the answer is on waiting. When I say yes, is on the fact that um, the way we're um, hedging against that and actually benefiting from all of that demand is that rather than having just spot transactions where we're just hey, I have 1,000, let me sell you 1,000 tons now. What we're doing is we're having a mix of forward contracts with spot uh, prices. So that allows, for example, with our partner landowners to say, well, maybe for a third of the inventory of carbon, we're going to put that on a forward contract so that helps us de-risk our operation. It brings significant revenues to the operation. But then we can continue to ride the ramp uh, of uh, price increase. So again, more than a binary yes or no, I would say that there are really uh, interesting financial constructions that uh, or structures that we do by having forward contracts versus spot contracts to a uh, percentage of the carbon uh, credits that, you're, that your operation is, is capturing. So for example, a farmer in that case would be, let's it, that would be part of our portfolio, right? To our partner uh, partners in a portfolio, we would say, let's look at the whole financial model. Can we just play that on on the spot trading, or should we, as a partnership, to risk our revenues by bringing already some revenues now, setting knowing exactly what they're going to be for the next, call it five or ten years, just for a subset of it, and then then you get more confident of playing how the the, the carbon prices are going to go up. So a farmer like myself, if I'm interested in participating in this, I can forward hedge through Cultivo. Did I, did I say that correctly? I, I could forward contract the price that I want for my future credits? Correct. And we would, so in, in this case, Zach, we would analyze your, the, the steps would be, you send us your shape file, uh, your polygon of your land, we would analyze it. We would see how much ca- carbon you would be able to capture. Again, against a specific methodology that makes sense, both of us would come to the table and you would say, this is my management plan. We would see how well it matches the, the methodology. And you would be part of our portfolio. Your land would be capturing, let's say, 1 million tons. And we would come to a point where the, the right financial returns to achieve the uh, IRR that our investors want is we should set up a forward contract for 10 years and the rest we will trade on the spot. So all of that would be able to uh, 
and that's what we do with our farmers. I'm just thinking here, if I'm looking at 1 million tons times $24 a ton, maybe maybe I should call men well after this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you were talking about the IRR in there. Okay, so Zach yeah. is, you're linking Zach up with an investor. Is that investor getting Zach's land and stuff too or other, no. other things? They're just getting, uh, Zach's going to get them a million tons of carbon over the next 10 or 20 or 30 years, whatever it's going to take. And you're saying, yep, I'll do that for over that long period of time. And, uh, you know, pay me a certain percentage of that gain right now. And then maybe they sell in different tranches or whatever later on. How, how does that IRR actually work, I guess? Because are the investors reselling? First and foremost, the landowner says to us, I want to sell or not to sell my land. Hopefully, it's like you don't want to sell your land. So you come to us and you say, hey, um, let's partner. But Mitchell, in that case, we would just be part- partnering in the natural capital piece at the top, right? So Zach continues to own his land, he has his uh, land activity. You continue to sell your, your ag produce. And uh, we look at the biodiversity, water, and carbon gains that your land will be. The investor, therefore, only through a portfolio, only brings capital to that natural capital piece. Uh, and the IRRs to that one uh, then tend to be quite attractive in the sense that there is not a lot of capital expenditure to acquire land or to have, for example, all the uh, infrastructure costs that Zach's activity would have. But we do, so therefore, what, what does Cultiva do with our uh, partners? So we will look at the whole uh, land activity. We would see what um, what infrastructure costs, sensing costs, in minting those carbon biodiversity and water credits would drive. We would therefore invest in that infrastructure up front. All of that capital comes from us. We actually pay for all the sensing, for all the registration and the carbon, different protocols, biodiversity protocols, water protocols. And we then have a profit share with Zach. That profit share increases a lot if, for example, Zach is the one that is going to be implementing those changes rather than hiring someone else, that uh, another third party that that investment, that special purpose vehicle that would that would be part of this investment would be distributing capital to. And therefore, the Cultivo is in charge of then marketing and selling all of those offsets. That's why the landowner is our partner. And once we sell those offsets, the revenues that are coming through are first used to pay the landowner, the different third parties. And then after that, for the profit, we uh, share the returns with the investor. So, and that's definitely where I think a lot of this can go because to your point, there is a lot of demand. There's not enough supply right now. So if you can get that capital to move quicker and utilize that future carbon asset and they can finance it now, and they are basically locking in the land for whatever that the term of the contract is that Zach's land is locked in. He's got some good cash coming in right now. And it sounds like a good partner that's going to bat with them to actually develop these offsets and you got somebody to finance it. They're going to get paid back. Basically their loan is all they're, they're doing. They're get, making their five or six or 7% or whatever they want to make uh, based on you and Zach going and saying, Hey, let's go figure out how many credits we can get developed and let's get them actually verified and sold. So it's definitely, cause I think the biggest thing on Zach's side is the changes that you're asking him to make cost him money right now. So the quicker Zach can get dollars in his pocket to go make those practice changes, that's the the crucial component um, to make sure that he's got the dollars needed to be able to go and actually make those changes. And right. if you're wondering that 24 million, that would be enough. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But, but more importantly, also, I do want to share some of the, the first uh, conversations that we had with landowners. This is by no means, in terms of the, the, the locks that are put on on that agreement for Zach to be part of that special purpose vehicle. This is not like an easement or something that would encumber your land if you want to to sell it. So that we also took a lot of care for uh, because we know that for farmers that is, or any landowner really, that is fundamental. So um, we also have done this with a, a lot of 
farmers and ranchers that said, do not touch my land. And that's what we wanted in the partnership. I think it's a really, really good way to, to do it. And something that I've definitely foreseen is what's needed. But how do you guys think about the liability and the risk of, you know, you're asking Zach to do a bunch of a bunch of things. Um, you're, you know, on the line to make sure that you're delivering back to your investors. How do you guys make sure that the couple bucks that Zach's getting that he doesn't get his $24 million and end up spending 30 million to get it. And then he goes broke because of the things that you're asking him to, to go and do. How do you think about that risk? And what I mean by that is things like going to no-till and using cover crops and stuff like that on a row crop standpoint, um, mm-hmm. it's different and it can be pretty risky um, at the beginning, especially if you don't know what you're doing. So how do you address that? Yeah. So the first piece of how we address risk is through all the different We've been talking about the data that Cultivo has and the algorithms as a way of figuring out new revenue streams, but those algorithms also look at risk from a uh, climatic point of view, from uh, droughts and floods, from uh, the the ability of the, the standing quality of the soil to um, also market pressures and risks from your produce itself, right? So we... We take all of those data points and we underwrite several of those risks. We then mitigate through financial constructs like the forwards, but we also uh, make sure that for, and I think this is more fundamental, to every farm that is part, to every land that is part of our portfolio, we bring an ecosystem of parties that will mitigate that risk. So what do I mean by that? We don't expect... For example, our uh, cattle ranchers that haven't done this before to know what sustainable grazing management practices would be, right? So there is a lot of cap- capabilities to be developed, and we bring the partners to the. Sometimes those partners are NGOs that have been in around the area for more than twenty years that already know what's the recipe to make sure that. Back to your point, the right cover crops are being set up or the right rotation mechanisms are going on. That is knowledge that Cultivo is developing, but actually our partners have been developing it for more than 30 years. So the best way that we're mitigating risk is by creating that ecosystem around, in this case, Sachs Farm, so that we can pull resources from that. And in terms of uh, the, the knowing if something has gone very expensive or not, again, the data is by weird by doing the monitoring, reporting, and verification that we need to measure those natural uh, capital attributes, we're also knowing all the time what's the pulse of the patient. In this case, the patient is sex land. Uh, and we know exactly uh, at what stage that patient is and knowing um, if we have to be more proactive to that care and make sure that we go back to where where we're forecasting to be. So it, it is... As I say to our investors, this is not, you know, distributing pizza. This is complex, but it's also why the returns are so attractive. And more importantly, to to achieve that purpose of the 1% uh, to be regenerated. I was never expecting that it was going to be easy, but it's actually very, very fun to do and very rewarding, actually. I don't know, Mitchell. What do you think? I think it's a good approach. And uh, and definitely really interested to see and watch and, and see how you guys really uh, dig further into me and Zach's, you know, part of the world with the row crop kind of side of things. But, but I think a good conversation for our listeners to be able to understand, Hey, there's a lot going on in these carbon, in the carbon ecosystems and stuff and, and other offset ecosystems. Obviously we've talked a lot about carbon. You can, you've done a great job, Manuel, bringing back up, Hey, it's water and it's bio, it's, you know, biodiversity and stuff too, which is great. And it's, that's so important. Um, but really interesting to see the amount of influx and the the push that continues to happen here and definitely a different perspective that I think is really important for everyone listening to this. Like there's a lot going on in this space. It's not just a couple of companies that uh, are calling on you to get enrolled in their carbon program. There's a lot of other groups that are involved in all this too. And a lot of updates, a lot of changes that are going to be made over the coming years. Yeah. Any, any final thoughts that you want to add there, Manuel? Yeah, so, so to I know uh, this is a podcast for from farmers to farmers. So do speak to uh, continue to speak to your farmers. And it this world is not as complex as it sounds. 
uh, we have deployed a, a, a lot of resources to make sure that it's simple and easy to, to navigate through. And so if you have uh, questions and want to speak to fellow farmers that are doing this with us, uh, please give us a shout. We would be really, really seriously uh, happy to look at your land and, and see what's the total natural capital that you're sitting on. I think it's been a great conversation. I know, you know, we talked a little bit at the beginning about carbon credits and how we've we've talked a lot about them, but it just seems to me like the conversation is starting to shift a little bit more now. And now all of a sudden I'm getting a lot more excited about the fact that I think we are going to figure these out and that they 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 are going to be something going into the future, that it isn't all just fluff and big claims and, and marketing, that there's there's something here. There's enough people working on this that this is going to be something. Yeah, I totally agree. And, you know, obviously we've chatted on this a couple of times. I had no idea that this was a thing at all until probably 2019 or so. And, and you had to be able to see the changes and being able to see the progress since that time has been really, really interesting. Now, I still think we have a long, long way to go. But to your point, Zach, it's definitely getting closer. And uh, in it's not going to go away. Like it at the beginning, it was like, well, maybe this is just going to implode and just kind of fizzle out and go away. But I don't think that that's probably going to be the case. I would agree with you. It seems like there's there's too many smart people out there like Manuel that are working on this that are going to make sure that this happens, right? And and like he said, these big companies that have made these big claims, they they have to be successful on these claims one way or another. I mean, people are going to figure this out. There's a lot of incentive. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, it's they're going to have to get it figured out. They're, we're going to have to go continue to go this route. And luckily for ag, you know, we're sitting there in a prime spot that we can help, you know, in, in that the, by being involved, we're not only able to contribute to offsetting carbon, but also to improve water quality and improve habitat and like stack so many of these different outcomes with the same amount of effort, same amount of work from our side on the farm. So I think that's another really key piece. Plus, by implementing and doing these things smarter, the actual quality of the product that we're selling into the marketplace to feed people is better and it can be more profitable just on its own. So I think it positions ag to be in a really, really interesting spot, but make sure that you're hedging and making sure that you're learning and doing things right and don't go broke chasing a couple extra bucks that it sounds like, you know, hopefully the price of carbon and other offsets is going to get better Obviously today it's not anything crazy. So don't chase a small carrot and end up hurting yourself and your family farm. Make sure that you understand what you're doing or getting the right help and uh, and really understand what you're actually signing up for, but uh, definitely move it in the right direction and there's gonna be some real opportunities. Well, I think uh, we should probably wrap up here. That's gonna be it for the Fieldwork Podcast today. Uh, our show is produced by Todd Melby with a lot of great help from Anna Canny. Thanks to Kristen Schmidt, who runs our social media, and to Lauren Humpert, who is our project coordinator. And of course, thank you to all the technical directors at American Public Media who help us record and mix the show. Be sure to check us out on social media. We are at Fieldwork Talk on all the usual channels. And of course, as usual, we would love it if you guys could write us a review to help other people find us. And give us a call while you're at it and leave us a voicemail, 651-228-4810, 651-228-4810. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And, of course, thank you, Manuel, for joining us here. Really fun conversation. We will catch you all next time. And I feel like I got I to gotta end this show with a, until next time, don't soil yourself. Don't soil yourself.